um, actually included the idea of um, a crime of uh, you know, massive harm to the environment, not using the term ecocide. And again, they suggested that that might be a crime in, terms, in times of war and in times of peace. And what we can gather from reading the commentaries of some of the uh, lawyers and diplomatic representatives involved in those negotiations was that that was dropped from the, from the draft four years later in 1995, mainly as a result of opposition from nuclear states who thought that they would be, their acts might be criminalized um, were they to use nuclear weapons. Um, however, the idea of keeping destruction of the environment as a war crime stayed alive in this code. And in fact, as you'll know, in the 1998 statute, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, it's there. So that idea of um, widespread, long-term and systematic damage to the environment in times of war is a crime now currently at the International Criminal Court, only in times of war. So moving to the ecocide story um, this century, um, you know, the person who really picked this idea up and ran with it and, and modernized it to our current context in terms of thinking about how it should adapt, how it should address the kinds of environmental threats that we're facing today was of course Polly Higgins, um, Jojo's former colleague who you know, I also knew. Um, so Polly Higgins did a massive amount to popularise this idea of ecocide and suggest the urgency of, of making that an international crime. And she presented her own suggested draft. There were also a couple of efforts, um, you know, very important efforts in France. Um, Valérie Cabanès drafted a long suggested amendment to the Rome Statute, and that's really focusing on the International Criminal Court. And someone called Laurence Meyret, who's written a fantastic, and he was the head of a project written a fantastic book. I always show it because I feel like it's underappreciated in English language circles. Um, a multi-year, um, multidisciplinary project which actually drafted the whole separate convention on eco-science and eco-crimes. And all of these efforts, of course, uh, will be drawing on in our, in our current efforts to, to draft a crime that the International Criminal Court could use. Um, so I wanted to talk now briefly about what the implications are of making ecocide an international crime. So we can go on to the next slide, Anya. Thank you. Um, why an international crime? I mean, we've talked already about the idea of international crimes being something that are crimes against all of us. And I think that sort of almost um, moral aspect of condemnation is a really important one. So, you know, the idea that ecocide is a crime of, of um, similar gravity to a crime like genocide or crimes against humanity, I think is really important for us globally to acknowledge and to memorialise. And speaking tactically as well, and we can talk about this a lot more in the Q&A, um, of course the idea of criminalising the idea of criminalising anything, it's got to be prevention, right? I mean, even the idea of punishing a crime is about deterrence and prevention. So we're not interested in putting people in prison, we're interested in halting climate change and saving our environment. And in my view, uh, I mean, we've seen what big fines do to the um, major industries that are harming our planet. Um, I mean, in terms of how much they affect their behaviour, you know, they don't seem to have much impact. Right, they're just written into the balance sheet. I think of individuals who are running big industries are at risk, not only of potentially being sent to prison, but of even being accused of committing an international crime. Um, my sense is that that would have a really deterrent effect. I mean, companies and businesses are very conscious of their image, and I think linking destruction of the environment to international crimes, you know, that whole narrative, I think, could be important in, in a number of ways. Briefly then, also, there's this issue of universal jurisdiction, which I mentioned, which is hugely important. So an international crime can be prosecuted anywhere. I mean, the states concerned have to implement that legislation, but the, um, the notion of an international crime is that it can be prosecuted anywhere. So that means, I mean, as we know, much environmental destruction happens in weak states where the authorities are um, you know, often not in a position to prosecute uh, or to hold accountable the big industries that are damaging their own environments. However, 
I think this one is an international crime. Any state, any state can prosecute. And in terms of the structure of the International Criminal Court, that really means, um, it, as we'll talk about later, that will be based on nationality or on, on territory. But these crimes can be prosecuted outside the situation of the country actually being committed. And then I think shifting, so I mentioned some of the um, legal actions that are already going on against um, the big polluters. Um, we see all sorts of creative actions. There's some really exciting things happening. I'm sure many of you are aware of them, if not involved in them yourselves. But all these um, fantastic actions, these crimes against future generations actions that are happening you know, here in the US, um, but also across the world, really creative uses of current law to sue big companies. Those depend on, those depend on the plaintiffs having the resources to launch those legal actions, right? If you shift it to criminal law, it's no longer on the victims. The responsibility and the financial burden is no longer on the victims. It shifts to the states. The states will then prosecute. And I think that's another really useful element of shifting this to international criminal law. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. So how would it work? And here I'm talking about the project that Jojo and I are engaged in, and that is to amend the Rome Statute to include the crime of ecocide. So how does the Rome Statute work? Um, just in five minutes. Well, there are currently four crimes uh, that can be prosecuted at the International Criminal Court. Um, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and a recent addition, uh, the crime of aggression. So this would be a fifth crime the crime of ecocide. The basic principle of the Rome Statute is the principle of complementarity, as it's called, and that is this notion that when a state signs the statute, it's not signing up to send every instance of an international crime to be tried in The Hague. Quite the opposite, it's actually committing to prosecute those crimes in its own domestic jurisdiction. So it's committing to make those crimes, those four crimes, current four crimes in the statute, crimes in its own country, if they're not already, and to prosecute that. The International Criminal Court is a court of last resort. So the court in The Hague only steps in when the national authorities, authorities who would normally have jurisdiction for the crimes, are either unable or unwilling to prosecute. So that's very important to bear in mind because um, the International Criminal Court itself obviously cannot deal as a matter of logistics with all of those crimes. But it also may be more effective for a number of reasons to have the crimes being prosecuted in different national jurisdictions around the world. Um, jurisdiction 